So, uh, Vincent, thanks for uh, joining me. Vincent San Santilli, uh, Chief Executive Officer of Homes for the Brave. Sorry, I'm cheating. Reading off part. To the beach. Yeah, good. <laughs> I didn't want to forget anything. So, um, why don't you tell me a little bit about uh, Home Homes for the Brave? Just uh, let's start there. Well, Homes for the Brave opened in 2002. And we serve men and women experiencing homelessness, almost all of whom are U.S. military veterans. We have a clinical program. We have a vocational program. We have a walk-in, drop-in veteran service center for veterans and their family members in downtown Bridgeport. We have a total of six facilities now, four in Bridgeport and two in West Haven. And we're just so proud of the work we do helping these men and women get back on their feet. 73% of them are experiencing mental health and their addiction issues. PTSD and, and the struggle to overcome addictions is a, is a very common denominator in our facilities. And so, again, we are just so proud of the success stories that we have. We have house monitors. So a couple of our, several of our facilities are 24-7, 365. So we have to have folks on duty throughout the day and night. And we're really proud of the fact that many of our alums, as we call them, we've been able to employ as house monitors. And I think that makes a statement about the work we do as well. How do people find out about uh, Homes homes for the Brave? Is it something that uh, is a word of mouth thing? Where do you get your most? Well, it, it's funny you should ask. We're a grant and per diem program in the VA. So many of our veterans... Uh, when they're in, the VA has a team called the HOT team, the Homeless Outreach Team. So when a veteran is in a scenario whereby, okay, he's getting evicted or this happened or he just got off the train here in New Haven and has nowhere to go, we'll get that call and, and we'll then make that connection. Uh, we do have scenarios, David, whereby veterans just show up at our door and say, hey, I'm here, I, I've got my stuff with me, it's freezing cold outside, I don't know what to do, and we're able to then make sure they're eligible because the VA has certain standards in order for the, the men to stay with us. They have to have had an honorable, or men or women to stay with us, an honorable or an OTH other than honorable discharge, and uh, which by far the great majority of them do. Um, and then we have an annex in downtown Bridgeport where we just opened that in June of 2022 where we serve veterans and their family members. So we have an intake case manager. We have a therapist there. We have an emergency food pantry for the, for the families. We have a group room that's being used by AA and other groups as well. And so, but it's a constant, I think, challenge to get the word out and to make people aware we're active on social media we try to really have as many opportunities like this one to get out and tell our story and speak to local rotary clubs and kiwanis clubs and knights of columbus councils etc so yeah, yeah. it's a it's a seven day a week job so there's people that um there's you have sort of day i'm going to say daycare probably better there's probably a better term for it, but is there like a day program? Is there like a, a, a live-in program? How, how long is that? So if somebody shows up at your door, like you mentioned, somebody shows up at your door and they're on hard times, they need some help. Like what's that sort of process like? There's an intake, he gets accepted. Uh, yes. And then what are the services he can expect to expect to get? Well, within the first 24 hours, he or she will meet with their case manager and then they'll develop a plan okay to get them housed because our whole mission is to get our men and women permanently housed so we're we one of our facilities is nine beds in the black rock section of bridgeport waldorf house which is a permanent facility so we had that opened in 2005 and we have had men that have been there 10 what, 10 12 14 years have men who live their life out there but our other facilities are transitional so the veterans are there anywhere from 90 days up to a max of two years. And then our whole mission is to find permanent, clean, safe, and affordable permanent housing solutions for them. And that's not that easy these days because the housing market nationwide is, is just brutal. Connecticut, kick it up a few notches. Fairfield County, take it even, even a few notches more than that. 
So that's easier said than done. But uh, the average length of stay in our men's transitional house, which is also our headquarters on pa Park Avenue in Bridgeport, was 183 days last year, David. And that was up from 120 days a year before. And it's not because our veterans aren't ready. It's because there's nothing out there. They're ready to go, but, you know, it's very difficult to find the, you know, appropriate solutions for them that, again, qualify as clean, safe, and affordable. You might get one or two of the three, but getting all three is, is pretty difficult. But in that initial meeting, the case manager will then say, okay, here's the, the long-distance housing or, you know, the housing plan looking forward. Um, do, does the veteran need work? Okay, and because how can they get housed if they don't have an income? And so the income is often derived in, in a couple of different ways. Of course, finding employment. Sometimes our veterans come to us and had no idea what they qualify for from a, a disability percentage basis with the VA or whatever the case might be. So our case managers will help them apply for benefits that they may or may not have known they had. And so that helps to piece the puzzle together. And then we look at their mental health scenario and say, okay, do we have to get them um, really linked up with a mental health services provider, which could be at the VA, it could be out in the community, it could be one of our therapists as well. And so that's a big puzzle that you're taking those pieces and, and setting a plan together. And then typically our case managers will meet with, meet with their veterans weekly in order to then assess progress towards the completion of the plan, et cetera. Are these uh, the veterans you take in? I'm sure there's, they're all different ages. So, so what's the majority? Are these, are these folks that are just recently out of the military? Or do they get out into the, uh, you know, uh, discharged? Uh, and then a few years later, now they're starting to show you know, PTSD and things like that, sort of what's that time frame like? Man, what a magnificent question because our veterans range in age. If you walk through our facility right now, you'd see men, at least our men's facility and the women's house is very similar. Men in their 20s, men in their 80s, and everything in between. Men with severe mobility challenges that are now in our house. And, and that's why um, right now, we're renovating, expanding, installing an elevator. So it's a huge project. And that elevator we've been fighting for for years. It's so desperately needed. So now we'll be able to have veterans that will be able to go from our basement where much of our programming is delivered up to the third floor and access, you know, anywhere in the facility. So that is really exciting. And the other thing is it's not – when you mentioned a day program and, you know, so we're not a shelter, we're a program. So it's not like, oh, you can only come like there's shelters in our neighborhood where a, a individual on the street who's experiencing homelessness then can't go until five or six at night. And then they have to stand outside and then they let them in and then they just sleep there. And then in the morning they have to depart and do whatever they do during the day. In our case, our, our men and women can be with us throughout the day and we'll have programming we'll have life skills workshops on thursday afternoons we just had a great one yesterday on financial literacy on fraud prevention it was delivered by the great folks at bank of america and so those that's a regular part of our program and we have computer classes we have folks that come in and, and do art therapy workshops and things like that and the really exciting thing about our renovation is that we're going to have a music room, and so which we've never had before. And we're getting uh, like musical instruments and things donated, so our men will be able to practice and learn. And we're we're planning to have folks come in and and you know teach and give some lessons. We're going to have an exercise room that we never had before, and a TV and game room. So this is so exciting. Ground was broken on um, August twenty one of two thousand twenty three. And we're 60 days or so away from completion. So it, it's moving along pretty quickly. And uh, so it's going to be quite something for our veterans. Do you do, um, let's say, a scenario here. Uh, there's a gentleman, 75, 80, maybe a little bit more, has a great life, really didn't experience any problems, you know, had a job, family and stuff like that. 
Um, now he's suffering from not necessarily PTSD, but from, uh, you know, other like, uh, uh, Alzheimer's or, or dementia or uh, things of that, uh, that nature. Is that something you could help a veteran with? We do see, obviously we don't deliver or administer medication. So when, when veterans get in that neighborhood, we then have to work with you know, perhaps the VA and others in order to find appropriate solutions. It could be an assisted living facility, and, and of course, that does happen from time to time. And, um, you know, so that's something we have to really keep a close eye on our, our men and women yeah. and make sure that they're, that they're okay. That's you, probably the best way to put it. Do you partner with anybody? Like uh, any uh, uh, assisted living homes, do you partner with any other nonprofits? Do you partner with any uh, real estate brokers or own? Because I want to get into that too. Like these homes, are they are they rental properties? Are they uh, mortgages? Are they a little bit of both? How does that? Our houses. Yes. Yes. Sir. We, yeah. Um. Basic. Well, we own uh, our three residential facilities in Bridgeport. We own outright. Mm-hmm. Um. The annex in downtown Bridgeport, which does not include any, it's it's just offices, okay? We have a therapist. We have an intake case manager who happens to be a Marine Corps combat veteran. We have the emergency food pantry. We have the group room. And so that, folks, and we do lease that. And then the two houses in West Haven, um, we were just, the, the grant was transferred to Homes that are Brave in 2022, and the original owner had been there for many years, and so they're leasing those to us. But as far as your uh, the veterans that are moving out of your facilities and looking to live on their own, so how does that all work? Do you have— Our case managers really um, <laughs> have to burn a lot of calories finding out, you know, the— appropriate comes from our guys and there are certain landlords of course that we do regularly interface with right. um but again if you're a landlord they can't necessarily wait till we have a guy if they have a, a you know an apartment available for example sure. or a studio or, or a room to rent or whatever they they immediately sure. fill it and there's so much demand out there but there are certain landlords there are certain facilities that as when we're able to Bridgeport Housing Authority, okay, has uh, the Franklin and the Eleanor. It's a building. It, once upon a time, it was Park City Hospital, which closed a little over 30 years ago in 1993. And that's been converted into congregate living facilities. And we do have a number of our alums are there and they reside there, which I love when that happens because they're right across the street. And, you know, we can, you know, stay involved and keep our finger on the pulse. And yeah. they might come over on a Friday night and have a slice of pizza. And, yeah, that's good. and, you know, you know they're doing, you know they're okay. You see them outside and, you know, and so that's, I, I think, important. Um, you know, some of my greatest nightmares in my eight, eight plus years now of um, of running home to the brave is just when, you know, a veteran does move and, and then we get a call from somebody later say, oh, they were found deceased in their apartment, or this or that, and for could be a, could have been a heart attack or, or or whatever, but those are that that's pretty heartbreaking. Um, what about families of the veterans? How does that how does that all work in? How many of these the folks you deal with have first of all have families, whether it be just a a, a spouse or kids attached with that? How's that all work? Well. You know, our women's house, which is in the west end of Bridgeport, it's five minutes away from our headquarters, um, is the first and only home in the state of Connecticut exclusively for women, veterans, and their young children. It has a total of 14 beds, 10 for the veterans, up to four for children or overflow. And it's been topped out for months now. We have 10 women veterans. Uh, We actually, right this moment, have three children, an eight-year-old little boy, a four-year-old little boy, and a gorgeous little girl that just turned one that's living with her mom there. And then we have a dog there that's living with his doggy mom there. So the house is pretty topped out. And, but that's where the women are able with their young children to keep them with them. And that's a big thing. And you know, that house opened in 2011 and I was in still in my banking career and I was running a bank foundation at the time, so I was there the day the house opened, and I remember thinking, 
these are going to pop up all over the state now. You know, Stanford, New Haven, Hartford, it's still the only one. Wow. Because, you know, funding is not easy to come by. And, and, and you know, and women, um, women veterans and women in general are used to, by their nature, taking care of everybody else. So they're kind of the last ones to then raise their hand and say, I need help myself here. Mm -hmm. And so... So it's been an interesting dynamic, but we're so proud of that house. It's a beautiful, beautiful house. Um, it was formerly a rooming house at home, so the Brave acquired in 2011 and gutted it to the walls. Has hardwood floors, stainless steel appliances in the kitchen, granite countertops in the restrooms. So when you think a woman, I remember being there the day it opened and thinking, holy smokes, a woman is going from perhaps living in a vehicle in the dead of winter with a small child, which has been many the case many times, to all of a sudden getting herself and her life together and back on her feet in this beautiful setting. And so, you know, we're, we're really proud of that. Where's the funding come from? You said you would think that funding would be, well, I don't know if you would think funding would be easy to get, but you would think it would be a easy sell maybe right to get the funding so what kind of funding do you need where does most of your funding come from for facility just like that one well we're a grant and per diem program in the veterans administration so each night one of our veterans is has their head on one of our pillows we are you know compensated each evening for that and then we provide everything we provide the food we provide the toiletries clothing everything and really enable these men and women to then especially if they're working, save their money so they can then pre become prepared to be renters or in some cases owners, which is not commonplace. But at any rate, and then we do a lot of fundraising. Uh, and it's funny, when I arrived eight years ago, um, a lot of the money was coming automatically just through the government. So when I looked at our revenue pie then, and you know our budget was $1.8 million at that time, and when you looked at the revenue pie, 20% was our uh, funding really generated by our own activities, mm -hmm. fundraising, grant writing. We didn't have a clinical program at that time, so clinical fees were zero. Okay, 74% of the funds that were coming in were from Washington, D.C., or Hartford whether it be the Department of Housing or whether it be Department of Labor in D.C., uh, et cetera, et cetera. Okay, and, and so it didn't take a genius to figure out then that th it wasn't going to continue that sure. way, that, you know, we'd have to really kind of flip this revenue model a little bit. So we've had a fundraise, you know, fundraise a lot more aggressively. Back then there was only two events each year. Okay, there was a golf classic, which now we're going into our 20th one, and then uh, a step up for the Brave, which is, you know, a, a wonderful event that takes place in August where people have 90 minutes and they, there's a walking course and a running course. They could run or walk to the extent and cover as much ground as they can in, in 90 minutes, which is mm -hmm. very vigorous. Mm -hmm. And um, and then they get people to sponsor them. We get organizations that serve as event sponsors. And so that has become, whereas the first year was 2015, it had 86 participants. It raised about $16,000. Okay, this year, last year we had almost 500 participants and we raised ninety five thousand dollars so wow. we're endeavoring to go well north of 500 participants and and go, hopefully going into the six figures this year and so when we look back at that revenue pie what was 20 percent of our own fundraising and grant writing okay now that's 56 percent what was coming from washington dc or harford which at that time was 74 percent it's now 42 percent and now we are aggressively writing grants, going to foundations, getting a lot of corporate support to the extent we can when we go out and tell our story. And then we have a clinical program where we have if the veteran or a family member of that veteran has insurance or whether it be Husky or Medicaid or whatever, we're able to get insurance for the therapy visits too. So, you know, we're kind of piecing that all together and taking that $1.8 million budget in 2016, it's now, it was 3.6 this wow. year. 
and and so you know we're serving more veterans in more places so i think that's that's kind of the way we do it it's the, the money's not just falling out of the sky sure but you know we got to really go out and get it yeah no it'd be nice if it did uh fall out of the sky sometimes so what's your goal uh short-term goal let's say the next uh uh you know few years as far as maybe where do you want that where do you want that ratio to be as far as the money you bring in and the money you get from the government what, what's your ultimate goal for that for that ratio well i think again we some of our legislators have been enormously enormously supportive and so we've got to continue to cultivate that support um and then uh, again we're continuing to really fundraise and, and reach out to corporate entities and bringing people in for tours of our facilities so they see the work we're doing firsthand and want to then get involved and and feel like it's something they you know feel almost compelled to support and and i think you know when you look at that the other thing and when we look longer term I think it makes sense for us to become more involved in a permanent housing uh, scenario. So one of the visions we have is that, you know, we've done, we have so much, you know, transitional housing right now available to our veterans and that is serving their need that way. But as I had mentioned, when it takes so long for them to find something permanent. So we do have a vision of, of creating at least one or maybe more down the road, um, tiny homes villages hmm. you see that happening in other parts of the country and it's mainly being done transitionally in other parts of the country but my vision has it to become permanent and that not to say that if a veteran moves into a permanent housing community we'll say that has the way we have it drawn up 40 to 45 tiny homes in a in a circle with then a little community center in between with like a, a little cafeteria and a computer room and a perhaps an exercise room, hopefully, and case management support right there and laundry facilities right there. So our veterans have everything they need right there. Okay. And maybe two or three years they live in that situation and then say, wow, I'm going to now go, you know, out and maybe buy something or, or do whatever and you know but but we can foresee that being you know that. rather than one or two at a time you know 40 or 50 at a time and and maybe seeing the outgrowth of tiny homes villages for our veterans i i think it's it it's really a solution that um can it does have legs and i, I think, I think it can great, work i think that's a great idea so this would be something that that uh, uh homes for the brave would uh, own and manage, and then they would pay rent just like they'd pay rent to any other landlord. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I mean, mean in, in a nutshell. Way, yeah. yeah, I was just gonna say in a nutshell, and and it's so easy. I shouldn't say it's easy. We did quite a lot of work in, in strategic planning to conceptualize this. Yeah, but that's the easy part. The hard part is then obtaining the funding, and then and then running it and yeah. making it happen, and then possibly the hardest part, David, is that. You know, everybody you talk to, wow, that's a great idea. That's a great idea. But then when you turn around and say, hey, and guess what? We found a parcel land right around the corner from your home in XYZ suburban community. And all of a sudden it becomes a very, very bad idea. What's the what's the pushback? I mean, you would think. Uh... Well, it's not in my backyard um, is really, I, I think, the syndrome that then gets unearthed. And that many people who, you know, so now you say, okay, you're going to have a group of 40 to 50, whether they're U.S. military veterans or not, living in your community that may have alcoholism or substance use uh, challenges, um, that may have been justice involved, which roughly 20% of our male residents are directly coming to us from incarceration. Mm -hmm. There's a veterans unit here in Summers at the uh, Connecticut prison. And that when a veteran in the state of Connecticut is um, term of incarceration is ending, if they don't have a family situation to return to, generally they'll be assigned to homes to the brave because of the the resources and the programming that we have. And so that becomes then a little challenging, you know, for us because then you're helping them find work and maybe it the, the 
hill is a little bit steeper when there is, you know, a criminal history involved. Where would you want these uh, little villages? Uh, I mean, what communities are you looking at? Uh, Bridgeport area, most likely, right? Because that's where you're based. Well, uh, yeah, certainly I, I think Bridgeport by far makes the most sense for mm -hmm. us because rather than, than spreading us so thin, and I mean, even when we opened these West Haven houses in 2022, you know, they're about 20 minutes down the road. And, and, you know, and so we're not physically there. I mean, I'm usually there at least visiting these houses each weekend, a Saturday or Sunday afternoon or whatever, but it's, it's just kind of spreading us a little thinner. And so I think the closer to our home base that that can be. Mm -hmm. And the, the challenge I think with Bridgeport is that much of the land has been contaminated. So it's then difficult, even if you find a parcel, having that land you know remediated and and so forth so you know so there's there's challenges but uh, you know i think a lot of things have to click together and if they do i could envision you know maybe in the next two three five years mm. it's something that we can because it is you know permanent housing in connecticut is just it's tough yeah yeah yeah, Tough. it is. Yeah. My son's in North Carolina and he wants to come back, but he's like, Pops, I don't know if I can, yeah. you know, what am I going to do? Where am I going to go? It's, yeah. it's, it's tough. Yeah. My youngest is uh, renting a place in Hartford. It took him a long time to find a place yep. and this is right top of his budget. It's, it's not, it's not easy. So I can only imagine, uh, when you're trying to figure out that problem for multiple people at the same time. Yeah, right. And your son may be like my sons. I have two, mm -hmm. 32 and 27. And so, and they have an apartment in Fairfield now, but that wasn't easy to come by mm -hmm. either. And these are young men with, you know, stable work histories with good credit and, and yeah. different things. Now, take one of our veterans that may have had a previous incarceration, that may have less than stellar credit, that may have even had a previous eviction. Yeah. Okay, it becomes a lot more difficult to find a suitable outcome for them. What about employment? Do you help these folks with uh, finding employment? And what, what are some of those jobs typically? Uh... Well, it's amazing. We have a vocational program, and it it's both for vocation, for employment and educational opportunities. So we have had, to, we're, again, we're situated in just beautiful place because our headquarters, at least, on Park Avenue in Bridgeport, is a couple blocks away from the University of Bridgeport, mm -hmm. and then in the other direction, Housatonic Community College. So we have had many of our men and women taking courses, for example, at Housatonic. We've even had some at University of Bridgeport. And so that is, you know, our lead vocational specialist, Ed Bellows, helps them find these outcomes. And maybe they need OSHA training or something to participate in employment for you know, in, in a certain, whether it be construction or, or this or that. So we have men that have been placed by our vocational program that are participating in, you know, that land in, it could be construction. It could be human services. Some are serving as peer support or recovery coaches for men and women that are now challenged by those issues presently. And we have had folks that could come out and become certified personal trainers, phlebotomists, mm -hmm. certified nursing aides, uh, nursing assistants, and so forth. So those are all parts, on, and some of the restaurant work has, is pretty popular. Some are going the retail route. And, you know, there's a lot of jobs out there. Yeah. But the jobs don't all, I mean, <laughs> when you then look at what the rents go for, so, you know, you, you could land a job, but can you land a job that will enable you to support, you know, paying rent every month, buying food, doing all the things you need to do, your utilities to keep your little household afloat? Come, it can become a little bit challenging. And the education uh, is paid for by, uh, is that the GI Bill, most of it? Do you in help many with that? Cases, that in work? many cases, they do have GI Bill eligibility. In some types of education, they go through other different programs. Um, Housatana Community College has been great about helping our veterans get, you know, get placed there and taking courses there. And, and again, in all different 
in, in all different areas. Yeah. Um, what would you want? Uh, well, let's let's do this because I've been thinking about it, and and I think it's important that those who listen. And if somebody wanted to reach out and ask a question, sign up to possibly get some services, or just uh, make a donation, how could people get a hold of you guys? www.homestothebrave.org or 203-338-0669. Excellent. Thanks. So I'm going to change gears a little bit, and we're going to talk about your radio broadcasting history. Because <laughs> why not? Because that's what we're doing, right? Um, well, first, let's let's do this. Before you uh, got involved with the Homes for the Brave, you, you uh, said you, and I don't really know anything about this history. You just mentioned it. You said you were in banking a little bit. What uh what, what's that about? What's what? What did you do in banking? What's uh, how did how did that <laughs> career lead you to uh, what you're doing now, helping out veterans uh, that really need it? Well, um, I, I graduated from college with a degree in economics and political science, and it, it was many, 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 many years ago. <laughs> and so, um, and so, I entered the management training program, the retail management training program for uh, a major, at that time, Connecticut bank. And just had a you know a three decade career at that bank and got involved in in serving our communities at the same time and 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 again had the opportunity to do a radio show as well which was College Hoops Talk so it was on WICC in Bridgeport uh, my um, the host of the show was Terry O'Connor my radio partner for 19 seasons and I was the co-host and it was a lot of fun and we'd go. You know, it, the show would go, it was a 20-week run each year from November when the college basketball season was starting, and the last show would always be right around April 1, and so, you know, it was it was just a lot of fun. Although, I do like coaching better, and now I'm, I'm coaching at the uh, NCAA level for the University of Bridgeport women's team, and so, so both are, are just a lot of fun. So what's your what's your coaching? What what do you do? What what's your are you the head coach? Are you the offensive I'm, I'm an assistant coach. Assistant I just coach. completed my fifth season uh, for the University of Bridgeport Women. I had awesome. always coached at varying levels before yeah. that, but never at the you know never at the college level, and just had the opportunity to join the staff That's here cool. at University of Bridgeport and and try to look at our women from the perspective not just as basketball players. But look at what they can accomplish in their, you know, in their careers going forward. I don't expect any of them to be like Caitlin Clark was last week, where okay, they're going to be getting drafted into WNBA and could make a career out of basketball, at least playing at this point. But I think there's so many things they can take that education they're getting at University of Bridgeport and really get. You know, so that four years at University of Bridgeport maybe could lead to a really fulfilling 40 years or four decades in the in the world serving others and, and really um, taking advantage of the education that they gained. Yeah, University of Bridgeport, I don't know uh, how many people know about that school. I know my dad went to that school. Oh. Uh, uh, I've been back. He had a, he's an artist, so he had an art show some years ago uh, or, or something like that. Um, but uh, tell me a little about the University of Bridgeport. I, I think I don't. I don't want to say it's a, a unknown gem of a school, but I think it's tucked away in Bridgeport. And Bridgeport people, uh, well, you know, Bridgeport. <laughs> well, I, I think that's. I think you use the perfect term. It is a, st a gem, and and many people don't recognize it. And, and what happened is that the U University of Bridgeport had some you know financial struggles over the years. So going back about three to four years ago, the school was in a lot of danger. And so what happened is it be, has now become assumed, if you will, by Goodwin University out of East Hartford, Connecticut. So Goodwin pumped 30 to $32 million into the University of Bridgeport. Um, the president of the University of Bridgeport was the provost at Goodwin and she is a very young woman that's very dynamic and really gets it. And what's happening now is the school, they've added 10 sports. They are, it's, the university is growing. You're seeing international students coming back in. And they really focus on careers that are in, in significant demand. So healthcare, we have a very strong, we even have a chiropractic school, which is one of only 12 to 15 schools in the entire country with a school of chiropractic. Um, 
nurses, a lot of nurses come out of both Goodwin and East Hartford as well as the University of Bridgeport now. Um, and then we just opened on campus at University of Bridgeport within the last several months an advanced manufacturing facility. Oh, and nice. we have employers all over the state of Connecticut with hundreds of jobs available, and these are great careers. And so right on University of Bridgeport campus on Park Avenue in Bridgeport, we have students, and this will benefit the entire community and really the whole state. So the school is on the upswing. It's got so much mm -hmm. momentum. And when you think about it, you know, when we're recruiting and we might be talking to a young woman from Brooklyn or somewhere, and then she might come to campus for a visit, and here we are, we're taking a little walk. And there's Long Island Sound, so your your oceanfront, and how many campuses can say that? So we're really working vigorously to leverage our location and to leverage the courses of study that we have available for these kids to really help them really turn out and and have great careers. Is that one of the reasons Homes for the Brave is located uh, where it is, or that just sort of happened that way? Was that I really think it just happened. Um, the the building's got quite a history. The cornerstone on our building, which is now being renovated and expanded, the elevator's coming in now, but it says 1907. And so the building was a convent for a period of wow. time because it's next door to what was Sacred Heart St. Anthony School. So the teachers were Sisters of Mercy nuns. They lived in our building. They walked about 30, 40 yards next door taught school and then came back and then that school like many catholic schools have closed and consolidated that school closed in the mid 70s i believe and then that became the mercy learning center in the mid 80s so it is now the mercy learning center what was sacred heart st anthony school our building then no longer had the nuns with the teachers so it then became the administration building for Park City Hospital, which is on the other side of us. And then the hospital closed in 1993. So our building sat vacant for a few years. And then in 2002, it opened as Homestead of Rave. And just some really visionary individuals, some of whom worked for the VA, Dr. Laurie Harkness and Tony Chinquanta said, we really need a transition. You know, the VA takes care of the men and women up to a certain period of time. Then we're, how do they transition? Can they go right from, uh, you know, bed or whatever at the VA into uh, or, or in treatment and then go right into their own permanent housing situation? Or do they need a step in between that will help them get ready? So that's what Homes that are Brave opened as. And so that house on the corner of Park Avenue and Garden Street in Bridgeport, then went from a hospital administration building to housing veterans experiencing homelessness. And so it's really had, you know, quite, it's just such an interesting history. And, you know, we're, we're just so proud of the location and, and really wait till you see it because, you know, the new wings being added and, and the new rooms are being installed and, and it's just going to be quite something. And, and what a great way for our veterans to then get themselves together. What a great, I mean, Bridgeport is a good location because there is a lot. You got the schools, it's it's uh, Fairfield County, then you got New Haven's right up the road, and you got, uh, it's on the water, like you said. Yep. Um, you got the ferry to go to Long Island uh, right there. I don't know if that ever happens with, with folks, but uh, sure. anyway, that's right there. Um, no, that, that's, uh, uh, that's really great, uh, great location. I haven't been down in Bridgeport. Well, I, I was just there a little while ago, uh, a year or so ago, doing a job. But um, uh, it, it has a lot of potential. I, I need some fixing up, Bridgeport. But um, no, that's uh, that, that's really good stuff. It, it yeah. will always have its challenges. But when you think about it, it's, it's a, such a diverse city. It's one of the most diverse cities in America. Hmm. Many, many languages are spoken in the city and in the schools. And that creates challenges, but at the same time, that creates opportunities. Do you worry about the, uh, you know, because Bridgeport, then you, you think crime and stuff. I, I don't know. I, I, forget, I don't know what it, what it is now, but I know it does have a history with, with violent crime and stuff. Is that a concern of yours, uh, being where you are, or not so much? Well, I just think when you look at the media today and, and when you turn on the news or whatever, situations happen everywhere. Um our city of Bridgeport, our police department's been great. And, and, you know, many of our city police officers and firemen 
are veterans also. Mm-hmm. So, you know, when they get a call and, you know, it's homes that are very involved, they, you know, again, they, they've been compassionate, they've been professional. And so, you know, we try to really vigorously partner with them and, and, um, and, and again, we're appreciative of everything they do for our veterans. Did you say that some of your, uh, uh, veterans that come looking for assistance, do they, once they get back on their feet, do they come back and either volunteer or stuff like that at the... Many do. You know, and what happens, though, they sometimes end up in all different parts of the state and the country, too. But the ones that are in Bridgeport area, we usually see them quite frequently. And then many, you know, we do try to employ. So many then are... And uh, one of our city council people just made that comment uh, last month and, and just said, you know, the, the amazing thing is every time I visit there, I'll see people working that were once living there. Yeah. And I think that makes quite a statement. It does. Yeah. No, I think that's great. Yeah. Because um, <clears throat> I'm not a veteran. My, my dad is. Uh, you're a veteran. Um, I'm guessing, or are you not a veteran? No, Excuse well, me. here's the thing. I My dad was a uh, combat veteran in World War II and died uh, quite young when I was a teenager. I'm sorry. And it turned out that it was service-connected, which he never really talked about. Mm-hmm. I was poised to follow in his footsteps. So I was nominated, appointed, and, and was recruited athletically to West Point. And um, in the uh, sp- spring of my senior year in high school, um, I found out that I had a uh, significant hearing loss. So uh, I was Sorry. disqualified from yeah. the West Point process. And so I went to plan B, which was to Philadelphia, Pennsylvania, to the University of Pennsylvania, which is a pretty darn good plan B. And um, so I, I guess as I tell a story, I'm, I guess I'm serving now. Yeah, you're serving now. Yeah, were you disappointed at that? I'm, I'm guessing you were. I mean, West Point, that's a pretty big deal to get into that school. You, it, was, it just came as a shock. Yeah. You know, and, and you, know, you just said, yeah, Mr. Santilli, you don't hear very well. It was like I was 17 years old, so you don't hear very well. I'm like, well, I, well, I, don't, I didn't hear that. And so, and so <laughs> that's and, my uh, point. Yeah, you know. So here we are, decades later. My wife will say, "I, I, I hear even a lot worse now," and she's right. Then, uh, but hopefully, she's not saying I hear just what I want to hear. But you know, so yeah. that's the, so that's been uh, somewhat of a challenge. But, but again, I, I think um, when I look at everything, I, I think I was meant to come here. Yeah, and, and that's here yeah. And so do you're, what we're doing. So, so you're doing your service now because you. Uh, yeah. you couldn't back then. I think that's, I think that's amazing. It, it seems like the veterans that go there are appreciative and they're, and they're getting back on their feet. Um, <clears throat> this may be a, not a, well, I'm going to ask it anyway. Is there any sort of, I want to, I want to call it a relapse. So folks that have come, they've got back on their feet. Something happens a couple of years, six months, five years down the road, they have to come back. Is that, is that a frequent occurrence? Hopefully it's not. Is that something, but is that something that, that occurs? Does yeah, that occurs. I mean, it happens once. It's more than we would aspire to have mm-hmm. it happen, um, but but that does occur. And and you know what? And and the other question that came earlier in the, in our conversation that um, really veterans end up with us in three scenarios. Okay, maybe they were working. Many of them are working and have had families and careers and then usually one of three things happens okay the marriage or or relationship breaks up and all of a sudden turns that man or woman uh, into a little tailspin Mm -hmm. the second thing that happens is maybe all of a sudden after not having done so for years or decades or whatever all of a sudden they start using you know alcohol or abusing alcohol and 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 substances that then turns them into a tailspin so and then the third thing that happens is maybe they go to work one day and then all of a sudden the boss says okay here's your pink slip because we're laying off so it's usually those three things and how they occur and the order, but it's usually the dominoes fall in one of those three things and usually one of those leads to the other one and then leads to the third one. So was it um, perhaps no. alcoholism then caused you to lose a job, which then caused you to your marriage to you know disintegrate? Or was it the job loss then turned into 
somebody starting to drink or use and then the marriage went or was it the spouse came and said you know we're done and then the drinking and then you know so it's, it's, it's funny really, yeah it's rarely and yeah. i mean we do have scenarios where the veteran you know was living and doing great and the house or apartment you know was in a fire and so he's been displaced or she's been displaced we do have those scenarios such as that um you know the landlord just sold the property gave no notice and you know so we do have those scenarios but by and large it's those three other things i mentioned in one order or the other in any one of those orders that them kind of precipitates that's in and i could see that i could see that ha yeah you hear about that too i go oh, why is he well he, he his wife left him or he lost his job and then right. he started drinking because he was and then his wife because of that that's interesting you put it together like that because one can it doesn't matter it doesn't matter what order but they all sort of go together yeah that's really unfortunate and yeah. they all then create the yeah. men and women then needing us yeah and so you know and every situation is different it's important to note that but that's kind of really how how it unfolds has there been any uh, feel good stories uh, where uh, a, a woman or, or, or a man come, come and because they, they lost their spouse and then they get back on their feet and they get reconnected? Anything oh, like that, you know? Yeah, we, we have done. And, oh, and some of our some of our even staff members, you know, we'll have people come and visit the facility and say, my, that guy there. He's so engaging and, and helpful, and then it came in and really gave to put such a wonderful face on your organization. Where did you find him? Found him right here, you know, and, and was yeah. here, and, and, you know, a particular individual might have been here two or three times, okay, and had a relapse and, and then was discharged from the house and then came back the third time and said, I'm going to stay on a straight path and now works for us for several years and is a shining example of, I think, the work we do. Yeah. We have another individual that, and we've only been in West Haven for you know a couple of years now, a little less really, who came to one of our West Haven houses and had whatever the situation was and has since been able to, while there, save money, was working, reconnected with uh, their spouse and from what we know and then bought a home wow. and from what we know and what we've been told that may have been the first case in the transitional uh, veterans facility in the state of Connecticut where the veteran then came and was able to then not just go out and rent but purchase the facility and move that back in and reunited with their family and so right. that's just remarkable. So we, we were on cloud nine for weeks after that one. Yeah. And yeah. that's what we have yeah. to do because we deal with some difficult situations day to day. And so we have to really celebrate our success stories. Yeah. That's, a, that's, that's a, what keeps you going. Yeah. And that's what it's all about is, is getting people back on their feet, uh, employment, housing, back with their loved ones. Cause it's not just spouses too. It could be moms, dads, kids, exactly. friends. Uh, okay. employers uh, it, it, go, it goes it goes down the line yeah. somebody who really needed help themselves didn't you know was experiencing homelessness can now go back out into the community and be a positive force and help others and so that's what we're trying to turn out do you have any um, uh, so somebody's living in one of your facilities uh, is for instance there's a, there's a homeless shelter in Hartford um, and uh, it's just a regular homeless shelter, and if somebody I'm familiar with it, yeah, and if somebody shows up, you know, high or whatever like that, that's okay. They accept them and they can stay there. They're not going to kick them out. I think other places may do that, but they're just not allowed to use in that facility, which of course is mm -hmm. a good idea. Do you have anything like that? Is it is it? Do you have veterans that come and maybe they went on a little bit of a bender, but they're not, but they have to, they need a place to stay, or are you a bit more hardcore? Be like, listen, you can't well, come here. It in used that to be when I first arrived eight years ago, it was pretty hard and fast, and really the world and the rules I think have changed a great deal since then. So I, I think we're <laughs> so much more tolerant. Mm. It's not like oh, okay. You're because we do randomly uh, drug test at our facilities, mm -hmm. and it could be it used to be oh well that positive okay bye you know and 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 things have changed a great deal, 
So we try to work with the men and women and work with their mental health providers and get them, you know, really ad- assess and address the treatment. And uh, and there's different models, by the way, in the different facilities. And, and there's a model that the VA offers called the low demand model, which means uh, a man or woman that's in a low demand facility is able to have... Um, is able to be using and having perhaps mental health issues and whatever, and then staff is there 24 seven to make sure they're supported and uh, and kept safe. And so that's different than where, okay, you're out, you're discharged and, and whatever. So there's different models. And one of our facilities now, not necessarily say which one or where it's located, is uh, operating under that model. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. I think that's um, it's hard when people because they're having a hard time because, yeah, maybe they lost their job or lost their wife. And this is something that they're having they're struggling with and they wish they wouldn't do it, but they're struggling with it. And they need to they need some help. It's hard. It's it's, it's and, tough. and, you know, it's I tough. mean, life is hard. It, it, no question. And I mean, and even how many of our veterans would love to just be um, nicotine free and not smoke. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. But guess what? You know, just about so many yeah. of it, it's rare that we have a man or woman that not smoke you know relatively rare so and they would love to give that up but it's it's hard yeah it's hard so again we just try to support them and try to meet them where they are and so that's that's kind of yeah. how we <laughs> so showing a little compassion but also showing uh that there's certain i guess requirements or there's certain Absolutely. steps that this person individual has to make in order to continue with the services but 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 you're also offering the compassion yeah sometimes services. you know we've had to you know kind of balance tough love with uh compassion and mix them in at the same time and you know it's uh it's challenging i mean our 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 case managers and and clinical folks i they're just remarkable and really i i think it's kind of my term but i i think many of them just come to work every day saying let's make magic today let's see how we can in in man it's just it's really it's it's vigorous it's tough yeah how many more years you have in this you think you're going to go, yeah, you. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, as long as, you know, I, I want to work as, as long as as hard as I can. And good. so, um, you know, I, I, it, it's very fulfilling. And, um, you know, so ultimately I'm not really in control. You know, God, God kind of controls, sure. you know, how long we work, how much stamina we have, how good our health is. But I'm trying to do everything I can to stay in shape and keep myself mentally yeah. and physically and able to, um, you know, run this coach and do all those things. Sounds well, you got to stay busy. I mean, it sounds like you've done a tremendous amount to, uh, to move homeless for the brave forward, uh, just with the money, like we talked about where it comes from, which I think is very important, um, to have, I don't want to say self-sustaining, but not to rely on the government as much as you were in the past. I think that's important. I think yeah, that's well, great. you know, and, and it's been the case for nonprofits everywhere because it just, again, the you know, even the state of Connecticut went through such a bad situation within the past few years. And I think, and I hate to say this, but I think the pandemic actually helped the state of Connecticut because you have people coming from New York and other places. And so, therefore... Well, revenues that weren't coming in and t- and things have really helped the state kind of get back on its feet financially in many respects. But because there was, I'm you know, going back four or five years, it was just there, there wasn't anything there. And so, you know, so we, we had to, in essence, and, and we do get criticized for having too many events. Every time we turn around, we're having another event. And, yeah. Yeah. You know, I'll, I'll stand convicted of that one. But. <laughs> You know, I mean, we we need to in order to expand the program, in order to keep the wheels turning there. So, you know, it's and what we try to do with our events, though, is make them fun. So people, um, I mean, in my four decades now, I guess, between banking and, and here and going to different events. I mean, I remember at the bank, you go to the thing and say, wow, boy, that was painful, but at least it was for a good cause. But we try to make our we have a mini golf tournament. We have a comedy night, which we just had a couple of weeks ago. That's all U.S. comics, oh, professional comics that are U.S. military veterans. And they were just, what an incredible show. 
And so we try to have, as people are leaving our events, saying, wow, the comics were great. The food was great. I can't wait till they have it next year, rather than saying, oh, thank God this is over. And so that's the way we try, try to make each of our events just something really special, something enjoyable. So, you know, it, it really creates, I think, folks that want to support our veterans. Where'd you have the comedy? Uh, where's the comedy event? Because I know it was a- held at Vizano's Four Seasons in Stratford. Okay, because that isn't there a comedy club in Bridgeport? Stress Factory or the something? Stress Factory? Stress Factory is that what it is? Yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 Just wondering because I went down there for a great facility. That was a great. That was a, they do. That was, that was a cool venue. Yeah, it yeah. is. We had a lot it's of really some there. something different. And that yeah. at one time was part of what was uh, People's United People's Bank. Oh, okay. Before that. it became yeah. People's United Bank, and that that building. Yeah, yeah. Uh, talking to you about the events, we met at uh, the New Haven Chamber of Commerce event at uh, Marcel Hotel, uh, the old uh, Pirelli building, Pirelli which is uh, yeah. a very interesting building. If you don't know the history of the Pirelli building, look it up because it's kind of cool, uh, that old history. And, and Marcel did a great job of um, keeping it uh, the way it's supposed to be, which was kind of which was kind of neat. So we met, yeah. we met at that event. Uh, yes. And uh, how's the New Haven Chamber treated you as, as this organization? Of the, Wonderful. Uh, you know, we, we've tried to, when we opened these West Haven houses, we said, okay, we've only always been just in Bridgeport. So we've got to really kind of, you know, begin playing a role in this community and, and having a presence here. And they've been just magnificent. You know, um, the Greater New Haven Chamber is is really to, it's it's something great. I mean, they've got so many members of all different types of business, and then the Community Foundation for Greater New Haven, just outstanding, outstanding. They do magnificent work. Their staff is amazing. They and they had me even make a presentation to the entire staff via Zoom at one of their fr- monthly okay. Friday staff meetings, and so they've been just so supportive of their work that we're doing with veterans. And we're participating now for the second year in the Great Give, which is one of their programs in which they, you know, have people all over the greater New Haven area. And, you know, it's something where we want people to know the work we're doing with our veterans and for our veterans. And so, you know, so, you know, we we try to be as present as we can out this way. Yeah, that's good. Yeah, no, it's a good organization. I've been a member for uh I, I guess a year anyway. Uh, so it's been good. I remember a couple other chambers. So they do, the chambers do a lot of, a lot of good stuff. Uh, it's been so good having you on is, uh, what else do you want to talk about? Is there anything else you want to, anything we need to know about, uh, uh, about either you and your broadcast career or home for the brave or, uh, what's, what's next? Uh, what's the, what's, what's, uh, next season look like for the Bridgeport basketball team? Let's do that. Well, we're we're on the recruiting trail right now, and we're bringing in a, a, some wonderful young women. Um, you know, we again are looking for that. You know, six two or six three post. That's <laughs> the, right now. That's the missing link. But we have just a, a, a great group of young women that are, I think, serious about their studies. That are looking ahead to their futures. Everything from whether who's going to be a psychi- you know, psychologist, who's going to be a nurse, who's going to, you know, be a force in the business world. And so that's really exciting to see and and help help these women during those those years. Um, we're now in the Central Atlantic Collegiate Conference, and so you know I'm working on finalizing our 24-25 schedule. It's going to be a really good schedule, um, and you know it's it's good basketball. So you know folks enjoy coming to the games, and and you know it's it's just a, we're building this program, and uh, you know I I think we're going to really Excellent. I think there's some great things to. Um, experience and and i think we've got some prom- very promising uh things coming ahead for that um my wife by the way is incredible i haven't mentioned her yet but she's a physical therapist and she's a remarkable one at that and um so you know so all this is you know keeping us pretty busy and um and you know our kids are just doing their own thing and Good. and really and my daughter is at Yale University oh, doing her. graduate work there and she's studying there uh women's studies oh excellent which back in when I was in school I I, I don't know if such a thing existed but yeah. you know she did her uh, undergraduate work at Fordham and now is at Yale and Good. um and has is serving as a teaching fellow there and and you know there's just um you know she's a writer so 
you know, at some point, I'm sure there's going to be a book, and you know, That's maybe fun. she'll write my book. Yeah, I, I don't know. Yeah, that'd be good. Maybe <laughs> she'll put an acknowledgement, uh, thanking dad and all that. Yeah, um, I don't dad, know. I you know, you know. We'll see. hope so, right? Yeah. What's your wife's name? Janine. Janine. That's a nice name. Yeah. Oh, that's good. How long guys? How long you guys been married? Uh, in September, it'll be 37 years. Good for you. Congratulations. Yeah. Thank yeah, you. Right on. That's thank good, you. Uh, it's, you know, I'm sure for her it's very hard, but for me it's easy. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, that's <laughs> yeah. Terrific. She's remarkable. Awesome. I'm so happy to hear that. Uh, Vince, we're going to wrap it up. Thank you again so much for stopping by. One more time before we do log off, uh, why don't you give us uh, the phone numbers and the websites one last time. Absolutely, David. Uh, Homestead of Brave can be reached at 203-338-0669. And then our annex, if you're a veteran that's in need of help in, in any way, shape, or form, we have an annex in downtown Bridgeport for veterans and their family members. That number is 203-275-0600. And of course, from anywhere you can get us, our website is www.homestothebrave.org. It's a real broadcast voice right there. Right on. Thanks, everybody, for watching uh, Behind the Brand. We'll see you.